Welcome to the Data Cloud Spotlight. Today, we're very pleased to be joined by Ed Ansett, who's the founder and CEO of i3 Solutions. Thanks for joining us, Ed. Good to join you. Hi, Bill. So i3's just turned 10 or in its 10th year of operation. Can you sum up some of the changes you've seen in our market during that time? I think there's many changes, but the two that stand out for me the most are the scale and change of scale in terms of data center megawatt size. You know, 10 years ago, 10, 20 megawatts of IT was, was considered a reasonably large data center. Now it's hundreds of megawatts. So there's basically around about a tenfold increase in scale. And along with that also, perhaps not as significant yet, but also very uh, prominent is the, uh, is the increase in, in, in IT load densities. Those are two, two main factors. Although I think that we're going to see a lot more increase in, in both of those factors over the next few years. Okay, and how about i3 itself? How has your company developed to take this into account? Well, I mean, we started off as just, you know, me and uh, a couple of others in Singapore originally. And to be frank, uh, initially we were focusing on, on uh, IT services as well as uh, MEP. Um, in, in the, we had the opinion that we would be able to combine those two together and offer them jointly. Um, unfortunately, the market as a whole as a, is generally not ready for that. So we ended up focusing on MEP and we, we grew organically, steadily, um, initially in Singapore and then lastly in the UK. Um, going from doing, you know, as you, when you start out, you know, nobody's going to give you a 100 megawatt project. You've got to, you know, in, in the crust and, um, you know, start out with the small stuff, do small consulting engagements. We were very lucky in the sense that we got some fantastic early engagements. Uh, probably most notably was the Singapore government data center roadmap, uh, which helped a lot in terms of developing the business's reputation. Um, and, and, and we've just sort of scaled out, I think, you know, a lot of people say this, but I, I, I mean, it's not a platitude. I mean, we've just got such a wonderful team of people, great cohesion between the people we have. That's helped enormously. And, um, I, you know, we're not the sort of company that's, that's, uh, is, is very much sort of um, bottom line and top line driven. We focus primarily on delivering great work. And um, with that comes the results, in our opinion. Yeah, it definitely helps. So looking back over the period again, what about technology in particular? What are some of the most important changes in terms of the actual equipment, technology, innovations that we're using to deliver connectivity? Well, I'm going to talk from my perspective, which is, you know, power and cooling, really. Um, although I'm, I love technology, I, I can't profess to be an expert. I'm, a, I'm an observer. Um, but I mean, the main, main difference is there was we've, 10 years ago, we were doing a lot of fault tolerant systems, um, you know, and they were still fairly commonplace. We largely moved away from fully fault tolerant systems to quasi fault tolerant systems. And again, there's policies of changes. So, Ten years ago, a uh, power system topology might be perhaps a, a four to make three distributed redundant. Nowadays, it's eight to make seven or even bigger than that. Um, Ten years ago, uh, static switches weren't in vogue, or static transfer switches, I should say, weren't weren't particularly popular. Uh, they, uh, they they reemerged, which is the basis of uh, the couple of patents that we've got, uh, something called adaptable redundant power. Um, and um, in terms of topologies, you know, there's been a, a couple of new topologies that have, that have emerged. Um, but I think probably uh, a couple of other things as well. Um, the application of sustainable technologies have become top front of mind now. Um, and that wasn't the case 10 years ago, unfortunately. Uh, but at least it is now. And it's, uh, we've got a long, long way to go. But uh, nonetheless, that's, that's moving. I think finally, the other thing that's changed and it's kind of come to the fore is the emergence of liquid cooling as opposed to uh, just traditional air cooling, although the industry is still dominated by air, air cooled environments. We're seeing a, a gradual transition to that uh, liquid cooling. So looking at a totally broad sense here, what do you think our industry has got wrong in the past 10 years? We got a lot right. What have we got wrong? We haven't got a lot wrong, in my opinion. It's just the industry is very slow to move. This is this is its problem, and and the, you can't pin blame on anyone for this. Unfortunately, it's kind of a it's a 
most of the changes you see in our industry are led by the hyperscalers these days. Uh, that that is, you know, once hyperscaler, for example, when Microsoft decided that it would um, participate in um, battery energy storage in Ireland, that was a bit of a game changer, really. And it's kind of sends a signal to everybody else: it's okay to do this. You know, so the, my my main my main issue is that you know we're slow. I can't see see that changing. I suppose, like many other people, I I, I don't particularly like this uh, this greenwashing. Okay, I mean the idea of um, you know, you become sustainable and net zero by carbon offsets and PPAs. Those are important things, but there are many more as important or more important things, I think, that uh, data center operators can do from, from an active perspective and active technology implementation. Um, but I think, again, we're going to see a lot more of that soon. Okay, so looking forward, what do you think are going to be the main talking points in the next 12 months? What's going to take the focus? Um, three things. I think um, I mentioned liquid cooling, so I won't mention that uh, in terms of any depth. I think demand response is going to become front of mind, and this is what I mean by um, active uh, use of sustainable technologies by data center operators. Uh, the, 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 there are so many compelling reasons for this. Sustainability is the overarching one, but. Um, the, the, there are many, many good reasons that this needs to needs to occur. You know, grid, grid, grid security is, is uh, alongside that, um, and I think that's a little bit controversially, but um, small small modular reactors, these small nuclear reactors, I think are going to be a massive talking point, particularly in developing countries. Okay, and how about for I three? What are you? What's in store for you in the next twelve months? If you can share. I. I I hope that we will continue along the path that we're on. I, I very much want to continue the research that we're doing with the Greenhouse Gas Abatement Initiative and continue to publish papers that um, shine a light on which sustainable technologies can be applied to our industry. Um, and um, yeah, just continue to grow the team steadily and, and, and build out gradually. Well, thanks very much, Eddie. It was great chatting to you. Cheers, Bill.